Hello, it's Dr. Bettina here. Nip in the Bud have received a letter from the parent of a 12-year-old daughter who uh, would like to know more about common signs of inattentive ADHD in girls of her age. So the parent describes this girl struggling with organization, with prioritization, planning. She has a tendency to zone out, particularly when um, things are not of inherent interest to her. And with a transition to secondary school, uh, different rules and friends, there has been this increasing disruptive behavior that she has shown towards teachers. Now, mum wants to find a way to support her daughter. So um, let's think about girls with ADHD. Well, first of all, just to um, separate our ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, from ADD, Attention Deficit Disorder. Um, one has the hyperactive element and one doesn't. Girls tend to present with ADD, but not always. They sometimes can have ADHD. Boys can sometimes have ADD. But what you find with girls is that the symptoms tend to be uh, more subtle than in boys. Girls are often quite inattentive. They are daydreamy. They're easily distracted. And quite often they won't cause so many problems in primary school in particular. So they could get overlooked. So what we often do find um, is that girls will be picked up in secondary school um, with ADD or even ADHD um, that only becomes apparent then. So let's have a think about what is different about secondary school, like uh, with the child that we're thinking about in the letter. So the first thing that's going on is that you have a teenage brain coming online. What we know about the teenage brain is that the reward centers in the brain are suddenly on fire uh, and it's much harder to inhibit um, a desire to act or an impulse to, you know, make somebody laugh or something like that. Now that is true of all teenagers, actually, particularly when they're with their friends, but it's particularly true for kids with ADD because the prefrontal cortex, which is the bit of our brain, which is like the control center in our brain, it finds it harder to manage these desires and, and these um, reward centers in the brain um, in the teenage years. So you've also got a social brain going on for a teenager. So connection with their peers um, and maybe making peers laugh or uh, doing something like that in the classroom is a big driver for them. So first of all, we've got the teenage brain. The other thing is that there's this significant step up in requirement for self-management and self-regulation, which happens in secondary school. If you think about it in primary school, kids tend to have one teacher, they have one classroom. The teacher is really doing a lot of the scaffolding um, and structuring things for the child. And then when they get to secondary school, they've got different teachers, they've got to get to different classrooms, they've got to pack their bag, manage their homework schedule. So it's this step up in requirement for these executive functions, which are in the prefrontal cortex of the brain. And that is a bit of the brain that tends to um, take longer to develop in kids with ADD or ADHD. So we've got a teenage brain coming online. We've got this step up in requirement. And then what can also happen is that the young person can begin to really feel like they're struggling. You know, they know that they're not able to manage all of these demands and they don't have the skills to manage the demands. They may feel that they're not doing as well academically. So that can uh, lead to them kind of acting up in other ways. So warning signs of ADHD um, in girls in the early parts of secondary school are a drop off in academic performance and increase in disruptive behavior. And also in some girls, you can see this big emotional sensitivity. Actually, emotional sensitivity is one of the most understated aspects of ADHD. Um, but for all young people in their teenage years, emotions are more heightened. And again, this is more significant for kids with ADHD um, because of what's happening in the brain. So if those signs are there for your daughter, it's really worth seeking further assessment. And um, what would happen, you would go to your GP and the GP would probably get you to fill in a questionnaire. They might get teachers to fill in a questionnaire. And then if these questionnaires are positive for symptoms or aspects of this ADHD, then they would refer you on to a specialist service and you would see um, your, your, young, your child would see a team of people um, who would do some quite comprehensive assessments to have a look at whether this diagnosis is appropriate or not. 
Um, what you would also want to do is ask yourself a few questions about early childhood because ADHD is what we call a neurodevelopmental um, difference. So that means it's something that has been there throughout the child's life. It's just a brain difference. And I think we have the word disorder, but actually there are many, many benefits to having these ADHD brains. Often people can be incredibly creative, have wonderful ideas. They see things before other people can. And when there are interests and motivation, they are really able to be incredibly productive and quite brilliant, actually, in many ways. But if, we're, if you're thinking about um, going and seeking this assessment, maybe ask yourself something about your daughter when they were younger. So do you remember her being particularly active? Did you um, find yourself always having to keep her busy? Um, did she struggle to sit down um, for a long meal or standing cues? And maybe even have a look through school reports in primary school years and see the, if there were any comments or, or um, subtle signs of inattention um, in those early years. For any child where there's a significant behavior change, we want to look underneath the behavior and we want to say what is really going on for this person. So I think this mother is absolutely right in saying, I really want to get ahead of this and work out what's going on. Now, just to say a word about medication, there is some medication which does help with young with people who have ADD and it really helps with the ability to focus and attend to things. Um, but if you get the diagnosis, it does not necessarily mean you have to have medication at all. And in fact, a first port of call in terms of intervention would always be behavioral and we wouldn't go first to medication anyway. So it would be behavioral, i.e. making adjustments to the child's environment, teaching the young person and the adults around them about their brain. And if that, uh, if the child is still struggling, then medication would be considered. Just finally, I wanted to say something about uh, a plan in school because um, I think it's really important and an inherent part of this mother's question. So what could we do um, to help with the situation at school? Well, first of all, um, what many schools have a kind of limits in terms of their school policies. Now, teachers always want to do the best they can for the young people around them, but they might be quite limited in what they can do, but it's really worth having a conversation um, and highlighting a few things. I mean, the first thing is try not to see behavior as can't do. Um, it's, sorry, try not to see behavior as won't do. Actually, it's often that these young people can't do it. So we see it as they won't do it. We see it as intentional. This is behavior, they're trying to be difficult, they're trying to be naughty. And if you think a young person or anybody is behaving in that way, what you want to do is punish or give a consequence. But often for these young people, it's the skills that they haven't yet developed or their brain is wired in a way that they're really struggling with these skills. So if we can see it as actually, this is something that they're working on that they're not able to do yet. It's um, often, you know, it's a generous interpretation of their behavior, but we're much more likely to be able to have a positive outcome. And if a young person is being given detentions repeatedly and they it's not working, I mean, we have to change our approach. It's crazy to continue to give a consequence for a behavior um, that is ineffectual and the behavior is not changing. So we have to look underneath it. There are some reasonable adjustments that schools can make in the classroom. For example, giving the young person movement breaks, thinking carefully about where to seat them in the classroom. Maybe you give them a card so when they are struggling with their attention, they can um, you know, remove themselves or go and have a break themselves. You really encourage them for um, this, what, what they call self-advocacy. So encourage them to ask and to let you know when they're struggling with their attention or what's going on for them. Um, it's also important to try and give them a positive role within the school. And there's some recent research that has been talking about the teenage brain in, this, in, in relation to this and how um, teenagers are developing their self-identity and they are looking for a positive role. And if a what they call a pro-school role 
is not available. So a pro school role is, you know, I'm a, I do well academically, all the teachers love me, those kinds of things. I'm, you know, my behavior is really good. If that is not available to the young person for whatever reason, then they will maybe choose a, what they call an anti-school role. I'll be the one, you know, to be the most cheeky to the teachers or I'll be the one to make my friends laugh, that kind of thing. So the implication of this research is that we need to give young people a positive role. So find something that they are inherently interested in, where they can shine, where they can take a lead amongst their peers. And when they have that positive role, then it might be easier for them to drop some of this behavior that's more disruptive. And then finally, um, I always talk a lot about relationships, but having strong relationships is very important. So is there a mentor, somebody who can connect with the young person and they can meet with them and really build a relationship with them? And this is not about meeting them whenever their behavior is bad. If we just do that, um, it's unhelpful in developing relationships, but it's really trying to have an empathetic, non-judgmental relationship with the young person where you can talk to them in their rational brain and help them to think about how they can manage better in the impulsive moments in the classroom um, and get them on board with thinking about a solution. And that can be often the, the best way to th turn things around for a young person. So thank you so much for listening. I hope this has been helpful. Um, please do send in other questions you have and uh, Nip and the Bud uh, and myself are here to offer some tips um, as much as we can. Okay, thanks for listening.